Tune in, church. Hope everybody's having a good week so far, given the circumstances. Another week down, another week of praising Jesus right here at home. Join with us this morning. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away. knocking seems to be knocking right at our front door we know that no matter what his love never fails amen my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness i dare not trust the sweetest rain In the Savior's love, and through the storm, He is the Lord, the Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. Every high and stormy 
Good morning, West Oaks Church. Uh, It's good to be with you today. Uh, I'm really excited to share with you from God's Word. Uh, Before we do that, though, I want to share with you just a few announcements. Um, There are not much difference from uh, this week to um, last week, but there's a few things I want to highlight. Um, Of course, uh, we've been sharing our daily devotionals on Facebook uh, from our page. And so um, if you haven't liked that page yet, go to Facebook and search West Oaks Church, uh, and we're on there as West Oaks Church WC. Uh, Go ahead and like our page, and every day we put out a devotional for you. Uh, We just wanted to also share with you an opportunity to uh, stay connected to our church through this time. Um, So if you want, you can text the phrase West Oaks to the number 97000, uh, or that's West Oaks, and text that to 97000. Uh, and with that, you'll be able to be a part of our text group that allows you to get our alerts, information, uh, and just updates about what's going on, reminders, etc. Also, one of the ways that we wanted to expand our church to you is uh, we've created a YouTube page. Uh, I know um, uh, most people know what YouTube is at this point, but uh, we just uh, were able to get that going um, this past week for you guys. Uh, so if you know someone who doesn't have Facebook but has an email, uh, you can go on YouTube and search West Oaks Church, and we're on there. And so last week's sermon was on there. This Sunday's service will be up this afternoon. So we'd love it if you could share that with those who maybe don't have Facebook and so we can communicate with them through God's Word. Uh, Today, I want to jump into week three of our I Am studies in the book of John. We're in John chapter 10. And so as you 
turn your Bible to John chapter 10. I really think it's important that we look at uh, the context of the story uh, because without it, it can be very confusing as to what's happening here. And so uh, in order to know the context of John chapter 10, I think it's important that we look at John chapter 9. So we're going to have you turn to John chapter 10, and I'm just going to summarize John chapter 9. Uh, Chapter 9 is this great story where we see Jesus, and he's walking uh, around with his disciples, and he's walking around with some leaders. And as they're walking, they see this blind man who's been there for a while, and the Pharisees stop and ask Jesus, hey, who caused his blindness? Was it his sin, or was it his parents' sin? And Jesus answers back uh, with an answer they weren't expecting, and he says, uh, it's neither In fact, Jesus goes a completely different direction and he says, it's because of this time and this setting uh, that God caused this man's blindness. And this like really messed up their thinking because people had really leaned in heavy to this thinking that that sin was... um, uh, a, um, a cause of sickness. So if you had done things that were sinful, your family had done generational sins, it was what caused um, this man's sickness. And so this was kind of this, this thought process for these people during this time. In fact, we still lean heavy into this. In fact, we call this karma. Uh, we operate in the, uh, the idea that if I do this, then my uh, return will be that. Uh, And so if I do enough good things now, eventually that good will pay off in something better. Or if I am uh, experiencing difficulty or sickness or struggle, it's because I did things that were bad. And so what this does is this opens the door uh, to this insane way of thinking that not only... um, leaves people thinking that their fate is determined by what they do and don't do, but it also leaves them in this concept of thinking that favor with God is determined by how good they act. So this idea essentially has these people living and thinking in this way that we're metaphorically opening doors in life, expecting things on the other end Um, based off of what they thought to be true. And so as they open those doors, they find that the thing they're looking for on the other side left them unsatisfied and lacking. And so Jesus does this thing where he addresses the root cause of their question and the problems that are under the surface or at least in their mind, it's on the outside looking uh, for everyone to see. And Jesus does this. He answers their question in a way that they weren't expecting. And then he spits in the mud. He creates this dirt, mud, saliva mixture And then he rubs it in the eye of the blind man. And he tells the man, get up, go to this pool, wash your face in it. And as he does this, uh, as his eyes are cleansed, the man can now see. And what's funny about this is that Jesus heals this blind man on the Sabbath. And these religious people go bonkers, like nuts. And uh, the, and, and the, the attention is on these Pharisees. But really the attention, um, or the man's uh, healing gets overlooked. And what's even crazier is the guy that's been healed has no idea who this Jesus is, what he looks like because he's blind. And so he comes back and all of his neighbors and all the people that have watched him sit on the street and beg are like, isn't this the blind man that, that Jesus just healed? And they're like, this, this can't be him. And he's like right in front of the guy. And he's like, uh, hey guys, yeah, that's me. And they're like, no, surely that's not the same guy. And he's like, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's me. Yo, like I'm, I'm right here. Like I can hear you guys talking to each other. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I can see you, you know, uh, whoa, I can see you. And so what happens next is awesome is they question him. They're like, okay, it really is you. Then who healed you? Like, the dude was blind before. How is he going to know what, who, what the guy looked like? And so he's like, I don't know. I was blind. All I know is I was blind, but now I'm not. I couldn't see before, but now I see clearly. And these guys are like, 
uh, we don't believe the things that are happening. So they go to his parents to, to get questions from them. And the parents recognize the brevity of the situation. They realize that these Jews are looking, these religious leaders are looking for reasons to kill Jesus. They're looking for a reason to, to have him brought out in front of everyone, mocked and ridiculed. And so they, they pay attention to the situation. And instead of rejoicing that their son can see, they step back and they say, hey, he's, he's a grown man. He can answer those questions himself. And so they didn't want any, any part of what was happening, and what the Jews were aiming to do. And so what, what were they trying to do? They were, they were trying to kill Jesus. Uh, and they didn't care who they had to use as the means by which that would happen or who went down with him. Their focus was avoiding what Jesus was saying about them and only on getting rid of him. And why were these Jews so angry? I mean, I feel like sometimes we, we really hammer home on these, these Jewish religious leaders um, as if they're way worse than we actually are. Uh, here, here's what I think has happened. I feel like these men... Um, had forgotten that God's grace was the reason that they had become God's people. And when God rescued the Israelites out of Egypt way back when, it wasn't because they were better than everyone else. It wasn't like God looked at the Egyptians and He looked at the Israelites and He was like, oh, these people are way better than the Egyptians. No, it was God chose this small people in number And he he said, I'm going to show you how good I am by choosing these people and I'm going to make them my nation. God used grace to to free them from slavery. And and what happened is these Jews had begun to lean heavy on this idea that they were God's favorite. And so what they did was they, they stopped looking at God's grace and they looked at life and their status as favored by God through the lens of how their deeds were. They had believed that only good things um, like this miracle happened to worthy people. And this beggar wasn't worthy, right? Like he didn't deserve it. They, these, these religious leaders stopped operating in grace and they began to operate in what we would call karma. Um, and so they threw this blind man who's now got sight out of the presence of these religious leaders. And what's ironic in this situation, and we see this at the end of chapter 9, yes, we're still in chapter 9, is this, is that these Jewish men who had physical eyes to see Jesus operate and heal were spiritually blind, but yet this blind man is made an example and is given physical sight. Uh, and his spiritual sight is there because at the end, um, he, he, he recognizes who Jesus is. And so this brings us to chapter 10. And there's really no transition between chapter 10 and chapter 9. Same setting, same group of people, same Jesus. So here we are, finally, like, I don't know, five minutes later, ten minutes later, whatever it's been. And here we are, chapter 1, verse 10, verse 1 through 10. So let's read it. Uh, I assure you, Jesus says, anyone, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he has brought all of them of his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but instead they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. So Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. See, Jesus in these first six verses, does something amazing. He uses a metaphor that these religious leaders would understand. And and what's crazy is these religious leaders are not good leaders. And so he takes this simple, simple um, metaphor, which is really complex if you break it down and think about it. But he takes this metaphor for a simple reason. He wants to dig deeper. He wants to explain the relationship Um, between shepherd and sheep in light of thieves and 
robbers. And so we see that one through six, Jesus does this wonderful thing where he explains that to the people listening. And then in verse seven, he takes this explanation and he kind of changes it a bit, but he, he, he kind of doubles down again. And he says this in verse seven, I assure you, he says, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. And then he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. And then he ends it with this phrase that I think most people who have any church background have heard before. It says, a thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So in these short verses that we see here, I think what we need to pay attention to first is this, is that there's this contrast between um, Jesus and these thieves and robbers or strangers. And so we see there's not many of them in these 10 verses, but they are important for us to look at. So let's look at them real quickly. In verse one, we see this contrast where the thieves are the ones who jump over the side of this pen to enter into where the sheep are at. Uh, see, shepherds in these days, they spent their, their time outside of the pen throughout the day on these fields where the sheep could eat, get water, stretch their legs, catch some wind. But at nighttime, when it got dark, these sheep would be brought into a pen where there was one, one way in and one way out. And sometimes the, the pen was attached to the home, or sometimes it was in a K, or sometimes it was a makeshift pen out in the field. It wasn't abnormal for multiple um, shepherds to keep all of their sheep in one giant pen. Uh, but ultimately, the, the pen where these sheep were kept was meant to be a place of protection for the sheep to hide from the, the animals at night, to hide from the... Um, I just wiped my nose. I'm, I'm not supposed to touch my face. Uh-oh. Um, but <laughs> these sheep were, were put in these pens to hide, to be protected from wolves, to be protected from animals that came, and even thieves, um, who their only way of entering into these pens was to climb in such a way where they, they could get away from the shepherd that was sitting in the doorway blocking them from coming in. So we see this comparison here where Jesus does this wonderful thing where he says there are thieves and he's talking to these religious leaders and he says there's a difference between these thieves and robbers and the shepherd. The shepherd sits in the doorway. He enters in through the doorway and he sits there at night and sleeps to provide protection for the sheep. But the thief climbs over the wall. Sometimes these, these thieves would climb over the wall and they would, to, to take the sheep, they would... They would do what they had to do to get the sheep out quickly and quietly. And so they would cut the throats of the sheep. They would take them and place them over the side of the wall. I mean, a very violent and very terrible thing. But th these thieves, their goal was not to come and maintain the life of the sheep. It was to, to bring death. Then we see in verses 3 through 5, another contrast between these robbers and thieves and strangers where um, we see the the, the the sheep don't follow the stranger's voice. But uh, with Jesus, we see that he is the shepherd that leads them out to pasture and they follow his voice. In today's um, society, we tend to look at um, uh, sheep and shepherds from the perspective where he drives them out. But in this setting out on these fields, we see Jesus actually, um, he leads them and they follow his voice. And then lastly, uh, we see this contrast between uh, robbers and thieves and Jesus, where in verse 10, where the robbers and thieves come to steal, kill, and destroy, whereas Jesus says he came to give life and to give it more abundantly. And so what we see is this, in light of chapter 9, where this, um, these, these uh, Jewish religious leaders had this um, incorrect perspective about life and grace and salvation, are met with Jesus and this blind man. And the blind man doesn't deserve this miracle in, in the minds of these leaders. And Jesus says, um, you guys don't have the right perspective, but this man has been set free because of me. His ability to see was given, not because he was worthy, but because I am good. And so in light of that, Jesus then takes this story and he, he shares it with these leaders in hopes that they would understand two things. So the, the point of my sermon is right here. It's two things. It's number one, it's this. Jesus uses this story to, uh, to reveal 
that he is the only way to salvation in this passage. And then two, he uses his story to expose how far off these leaders had come. To, to, to show them how wrong they had gotten this concept of grace and salvation. So I just want to briefly hit a couple things and then we'll be done and you guys can, can go about the rest of your day. I, I want to stop for a second and say, okay, let's look at the three characters within this story. Number one, let's look at the sheep. Um, the sheep are those that belong to the shepherd. And so in this case, the Jews listening would assume that Jesus is talking specifically about them, right? They're God's people. They're the Jewish Israelites, right? These are God's people. And a shepherd would have a specific group of sheep, a flock that belonged to him. And so while sheep were somewhat intelligent, they um, didn't really have much means to take care of themselves. They didn't have gnarly fangs or, or uh, claws or, or they weren't very aggressive and strong. They didn't have the means to protect themselves. So they needed a shepherd. They needed someone to watch over them. And so a shepherd would be one who uh, had a staff and who would protect them and take care of them. Uh, but the, the great thing about a sheep is they've got really great hearing and really crazy peripheral vision. Like they have almost like 320 degree, like they could really just kind of look behind themselves without turning their head. It's wild stuff. I had to look this up uh, because I don't, this is Texas. I don't mess with sheep. We got cows, right? Um, so what, I, what we know about this though is that sheep provide food and clothing for us, right? Um, but the sheep... They matter the most to the shepherd protecting them. Uh, he protects them for a purpose. His job with these sheep is specific. And so the sheep have value. They have value to the shepherd. They matter. And while the others outside may not see them in the way that the shepherd does, the sheep mattered. And so in this case, these sheep knew their shepherd's voice. Uh, they are also sheep who are prone to wonder. We used to sing this song when I was a kid um, as um, we are prone to wonder based off of what the scriptures teach us like sheep who have gone astray, Romans tells us. Um, but at the same time, sheep are prone to wonder. I want to reiterate this idea that sheep are immensely valuable. And in light of Jesus, the shepherd's view of these sheep was more than just a financial gain. I mean, think about it. He probably spent all of his time with them. So much so that the Bible says that he had individual, Jesus says he had individual names for these sheep. I mean, think about the time that he spent with those sheep. I think about David, about his time taking care of his sheep before he comes to meet Goliath. His ability to, to fend off bears and, and lions. I mean, it's amazing the um, strength that a shepherd has, but the time spent with them means that he understands each shepherd and he gives them a name, right? The, these sheep had their own names. And in fact, the Bible tells us in Revelation, there's this comparison that when Jesus comes back to get his sheep, that, uh, that they will all get new names. Um, it's really kind of a cool comparison there. I and mean, so just like Peter, who was once Simon, got a new name, so will we get new names. And so when we look at the sheep, the Jews were looking at it from the perspective of that, oh, Jesus must be talking about us. He's claiming to be the Messiah for the Jews. Obviously, he's talking about us. But yet, Jesus does something a little different here. He, in turn, begins to address these leaders, these religious folk, um, as false teachers. And he calls them robbers and thieves. Now, these false teachers that Jesus were talking about were ones that preached lies and were only about selfish gain. He says that these robbers and thieves existed before he did, during his day. In fact, today in our culture, there are still many false teachers out there that are only in for preaching for selfish gain. Jesus says these men were marked by their selfishness and it wasn't uncommon. And I believe that Jesus is speaking directly to these leaders because he's realized that these sheep that belong to God, these, these Jewish men and women that were in the crowd listening to him and these, uh, and these leaders talk, have been without a shepherd for a while. 
I, I look at, at Matthew chapter 8, right before this in chapter 9. Um, we see this story where Jesus is about to commission his disciples out and he stops and he looks at the crowd. And it says in verse 36 that when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. I don't think Jesus is talking about physical. I think he's talking about spiritual. I think what Jesus is understanding is that they, there is a need for hope and salvation for these people, and the religious leaders weren't providing that. And so when we look at our culture today, there's many pastors out there uh, right now who are doing the same thing I'm doing. Uh, they're on Facebook Live. Uh, maybe they pre-recorded. Uh, and, they're, and they're preaching to their flock. And many of them are preaching to you the Word of God because they understand that this is what we base um, our hope in is Jesus and the Word of God. But there are much more, um, there are many more pastors out there who are not preaching the Word of God. And they're in it for selfish gain. Just as there was poor leadership in this day, we can look around and understand that there are poor leadership out there leading our churches today. And so we need to be careful about the people that we um, spend our time studying and under, listening to. We need to be careful about the ones that we, that we look at as pastors uh, because many of these people are out there who are teaching about wealth and spiritual power but never point anyone to the cross. They're always talking about how God's given you strength to overcome this and that God doesn't want you to walk through that, but that is completely contradictory to the Scripture. And we have to judge a man's words by the Word of God itself, and that includes me. So I would hope that as, as you attend our church, whether it's online or when we finally get to meet again in person, uh, that you would see that it's not about us gaining notoriety in the, in the community or the public, but it's about preaching God's Word to you. Because as the under-shepherd to the true shepherd, that is Jesus, it's our responsibility to take care of God's flock. And so Jesus, He points out that these, these, um, these evil doers, these evil men, these robbers and thieves, they have come not to bring hope, but they have come to bring death. So we have to be weary of them. We must look to pastors that teach the Word of God. We need to be careful of men who don't preach that Jesus is God. We need to be careful of men who make room for sin and excuse it in the name of love and modernity. And we need to be careful of pastors that teach you God wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy when all of Scripture teaches us that God actually wants you to be holy. There's a difference. One is for time on earth and the other one is for eternity. And God is for our time here, but He's ultimately for our holiness. And so Jesus points to these men and obviously they get, they're fired up. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to be called a robber and a thief. Especially when the robber and the thief's characteristics are death. Uh, the last character we look at is Jesus, who identifies himself as the door. Next week we're going to look at, as this passage continues, where Jesus goes from saying that he is the door and then he is the, the shepherd. The, but, but I want to focus here on the door. What is Jesus saying here? Why is he calling himself the door? Uh, the door was significant. Remember, there's one way in and one way out. And, and the door was, entry in, it was entrance to the pen. It was also an entry into the pasture. One brought security. That was the pen. It was security from the enemy. It was security from the outside. It's a place where they knew that they were safe. And the pasture, which was led by the shepherd, was a place where they could graze for food. This is a place where they could get water. This is where they, they could live in peace. And the shepherd was the one that lay down in the middle of the door. The sheep would not go unless the shepherd led them and called them by name. So Jesus is calling himself the door. Why is he doing that? Simply put, Jesus is showing us that life and protection, salvation, is only found in Him. And this is a concept that was difficult for the people listening to gather because in their mind they knew the Messiah was coming. They just didn't know it was going to be Him. 
And while they had been waiting for this Messiah to come, they had not fixated their eyes on God's Word and waiting for Him to reveal Himself to the world. Instead, they began to live in such a way where they were led by their stomach and by their minds and by their hearts. And Scripture tells us really clearly that our hearts are the worst things that lead us. They're the most deceitful thing about us. And so Jesus steps in and He, he tells these leaders, hey, look, look you've, you've missed it, right? You've missed it. And Jesus then gives them hope as well. He says, look, I am the door to which these sheep can enter into. And Jesus says, I am the way that you find life and protection and security. And he says, when we walk through this door, what we're doing is we're saying no to every other door that we think provides life and protection and security and affirmation. So the question for you and I is this today. Um, which doors are we walking through expecting life to be on the other end? Which doors are we opening, hoping to find protection and peace and hope? If it's not Jesus, we will be found left wanting. Some of us, we, we walk through the door of financial freedom looking for refreshment. If I can just get debt free, then I'll be where I want to be. I mean, if I could just go through that door where there's no more debt, I'm good to go, then I'll find peace. And trust me, debt free is a great place to be. Uh, but what I want to reiterate here is this, is that even that does not bring finance, that financial freedom does not bring eternal peace. Some of us are walking through the door of self-gratification because it looks fancy and it looks simple and easy to open. And so we pursue whatever is appealing at that time only to find ourselves not living in life but walking in death. I mean, it's easy. And whatever that is, self-gratification, whether it's food or sex, stuff, happiness, Whatever brings us gratification at the time. We look at that as a door that we can open, hoping to get something on the other end that would provide only what Jesus can provide. And the last thing I want to say is this. You know, these Jews had bought into the mindset that when Jesus talked about the sheep, like surely, okay, they could get past um, some of the things that Jesus said, but at least they understood, or at least they thought they understood that He was talking about them when He talked about sheep. But know this. And when Jesus talked about acquiring sheep for His flock, understand that that door is open for all. When we finish the last part of John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, we see this beautiful statement where Jesus says this. In 9, He says, I am the door. If anyone enters, anyone, they will be saved. Now, this is the first time in Scripture where we see this phrase, they will be saved. He says, anyone that will come in and go out will find pasture. So when we look at this passage, I want us to understand this. Salvation comes not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. Who are the Gentiles? That's you and me. If you're, if you're not Jewish, like, you're Gentile, that's you and me. So we need to be able to look at this and understand that while Jesus has extended salvation to you and to me, know that that same invitation to come through the door is extended to the people across the street from you that you may or may not get along with. That same, that, the same invitation to come through the door is extended to those sheep that may not look like you, who may not think like you, who may not vote like you. They may have a different perspective about a president, or they might have a different perspective about how we should vote, or they may have a different perspective on race. Understand that you cannot clean yourself up enough to find God's favor. You cannot do enough of the right things in order for God to now let you in. Look, the only reason why we're let into God's flock is because He's good. But the only way we can get in is through Jesus. And so I want to end our, our time together with this. Do you believe that Jesus is the pathway to protection in life? 
If you are at home today and you can honestly look at your life and say, I believe Jesus is who he said he was. I believe Jesus can do what he said he could do. I believe that he died and he rose again. And I believe the statements about um, following after him and trusting that he is God is true. And if that's you, then you have walked through the door and you are now one of God's sheep. You are part of the flock. Praise God for you. Know this, that you are his sheep forever. The scriptures teach us that His protection is eternal. But if you're not one of those, understand that that invitation that I've received, maybe the people that you know who've walked with God for a while have received, that same invitation extends to you. You know, it's in Jesus that we have protection. We have security. We know that in Him, not only are we secure from the, the attacks of the enemy, but we also see that we are secure and safe from the attacks of the false teachers. You know, the, the Bible says that the sheep hear His voice, and they don't respond to the false teacher's voice. You know why? Because when we're His, we know our shepherd's voice, and we know when someone's pretending. Like, you know how you can tell a counterfeit? You study the original. And when we look at who Jesus is, when we see God's Word, we can see everything else that pretends or sounds like, right? We can tell the difference. And so I would encourage you today, it's this, that same invitation that, that I've been given, not because I'm good, but because He's good is extended to you. And listen, you find, you find security and protection in Jesus, we are not without hope who have been saved. Since Jesus is the one that has led us to the pasture where we can graze and have freedom, this is where life is found. The life that Jesus offers is not just about pleasures on earth, but it's about eternal life. Hope for today, hope for tomorrow. Hope for this season in life, hope for every season. Hope in this terrible time that we're experiencing and hoping things are good. It's in Him that we have eternal hope. See, the gift of Jesus is not health and wealth and prosperity. It's eternity with Him. It's relationship with God. It's in Him that we see the things that He, that he brought around us that we thought would satisfy. It's in Him that we see those things will never do. So if you're in Christ, rest in this truth today. You are secure in Jesus' hands. You have life abundantly, overflowing. It never runs out. Possessions won't bring you joy. Things won't bring you hope. People will give you love for a little bit. But it's only Christ that provides all of those things and peace. And if you aren't in Christ, remember the door is open to you today. If that's you, if you're standing there at home going, I need and I want that hope and that eternal life, would you please, please give me a call, send me an email, shoot me a text. You can send us a message on our Facebook page. Um, please send us an email at weststokesonline at gmail.com. I'd love to reach out to you. I'm going to pray for you guys and then we're going to be done with our sessions today. So let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you sent him for us. Even though we were, were sinners um, who weren't worthy of love and salvation, uh, you came anyways and you rescued us and made us your, your sheep. You have brought us into your flock because you are the shepherd. And thank you for being the way and the means by which we find security and we find peace and life. Jesus, life is in you and you alone. I pray for my brothers and sisters listening today, God, that you would, you would be near th to them today. Speak hope and life into them through your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, we love you and appreciate you being a part of our, our service this morning. Can't wait to be with you again next week. If you have any prayer requests or things that you need from us this week, please let us know. We'll see you next time. Blessings to you.